patriot. The word patriot doesn't appear in the King James Version Bible. However, we have many examples of patriotism in the King James Version Bible. The definition we probably most often associate with the word patriot is one who loves their country and zealously supports its interest and authority. When I think of patriot, my mind can't help but race to what happened in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania on July 4th, 1776. 247 years ago, 56 brave men gathered to sign a document entitled the Declaration of Independence. I say they were brave because I can assure you that King George considered signing that document an act of treason. The document, which was penned by Thomas Jefferson, stated, and I quote, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among those are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. End of quote. The document goes on to list the numerous grievances and injuries brought upon the 13 colonies by the rule of the British Empire. Those who signed the Declaration of Independence, those who fought in the American Revolution, and those who have fought in every other war that the United States has waged are true patriots. The word patriot also has a different meaning that we're going to learn today. More on that in a moment. Open your Bibles to Deuteronomy 26.1 as we ask that word of wisdom in Yeshua's precious name. Father, we ask you to open eyes, open ears this day. Deuteronomy chapter 26, verse 1. And it reads, <clears throat> And it shall be when thou art come unto the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance, and possessest it, and dwellest therein. At the time of this writing, he was talking about the land of Canaan. Today, our inheritance is right here, the United States of America. And how blessed, I mean truly blessed, we all are that we have the rights and the freedoms. That thou shalt take the first of all the fruit of the earth, the first fruits, which thou shalt bring of thy land that the Lord thy God giveth thee, and shall put it in a basket and shall go unto the place which the Lord thy God shall choose to place his name there. The name that we worship, Yeshua. Logos in the Greek language. The word. The, the living word. And you should bring your first fruits only to a church that teaches uh, who Yeshua is and the true word of God. First fruits by the way, are, are always uh, symbolic, if you will, of your love for your heavenly Father. You remember Cain's offering, first fruits. He didn't bring his first fruits. His offering wasn't accepted of the Lord. Abel, on the other hand, brought his first fruit offerings, and his offering was accepted. And thou shalt go unto the priest that shall be in those days, and say unto him, I profess this day unto the Lord thy God that I am come unto the country which the Lord swear unto our fathers for to give us the promised land. And the priest shall take the basket out of thine hand and set it down before the altar of the Lord thy God. And thou shalt speak and say before the Lord thy God, a Syrian ready to perish, was my father. And he went down into Egypt, and sojourned there with a few, 
and became there a nation, the nation of Israel, great, mighty, and populous. The Syrian, of course, here is Jacob. Uh, he was Syrian by geographic location. They were about to perish, all right. They were about to starve to death. If not for Joseph uh, going down into Egypt and procuring favor with Pharaoh, they probably would have starved to death. They were few in number. Exodus chapter 1, verses uh, 1 through 5. They were 70 in number. And they come out of, of Egypt, what I would estimate, 2.1 million people by the first numbering in the book of Numbers. I want to introduce you to another meaning of the word patriot. The Webster's Dictionary defines a patriot of one's father. Think about that. Of one's father. Inheritance is important to your heavenly father. Jacob valued his inheritance. His brother Esau did not value his inheritance. He traded his birthright for a bowl of red pottage. This made me think about in the Strong's Concordance, word 7017, Kenites. It's patron, which is abbreviated version of patronymic, of 7014, which is Cain. That's what Kenites means, sons of Cain, of one's father. Patronymic, a form of the word patriot. Verse 6, and the Egyptians evil entreated us and afflicted us and laid upon us hard bondage. The most menial labor that was done in Egypt was done by the Hebrews. And when he cried unto the Lord God of our fathers, the Lord heard our voice and looked on our affliction and our labor and our oppression. When you cry unto the Lord today, he hears, he understands when you're being oppressed. And the Lord brought us forth out of Egypt with a mighty hand and with an outstretched arm and with great terribleness, awesomeness, a better word, and with signs and with wonders, miracle after miracle. And he hath brought us unto this place, and hath given us this land, even a land that floweth with milk and honey. Don't ever forget to thank the Father for our country. The fruitfulness of our country is awesome. You know, the United States is far from perfect, but it is by far the best place in the world to live. I've often said that every senior that graduates high school should have to go to a foreign country. And I'm not meaning third world countries either. I've visited Germany numerous times. Germany is an industrialized nation. They don't have what we have. They're very, very frugal in Germany for the most part. Um, but if the seniors had to go from high school, had to go and visit a country, I think they would have a greater appreciation for what we have here in the United States of America. And now, behold, I have brought the first fruits of the land which thou, O Lord, hast given me. Don't overlook that. We can't give anything to our Heavenly Father that he hasn't already given to us. And thou shalt set it before the Lord thy God and worship before the Lord thy God. Let him know you love him. Let him know you appreciate what you have. When we think of patriots, we often think of men fighting in war. There's a couple of female patriots written of in the book of Judges. Turn with me to Judges chapter 4. And you know I'm talking about Deborah and Jael. Judges chapter 4. We're going to pick it up with verse 1. 
And the children of Israel again did evil. In the Hebrew, that's the evil, meaning idolatry, in the sight of the Lord when Ehud was dead. Ehud was the second judge of Israel. And through the judges, you see it time and time. It's like a cycle. The people mess up. They cry out to the Lord. The Lord sent a deliverer, a judge, to, to deliver them from their oppression. The word judge means to set right and rule. That's what they needed. Ehud, this indicates, while he was alive, they didn't commit idolatry. What they needed was someone to set things right and rule. And the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan, that reigned in Hazor. Hazor was allotted to Naphtali originally, the captain of whose host was Sisera, which dwelt in Herosheth of the Gentiles. And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, for he had 900 chariots of iron, and 20 years he mightily oppressed the children of Israel. And these chariots of iron were chariots that had iron blades attached to the wheels. And when they drove those through uh, footmen, it just mowed them down, basically. So they were very afraid of these. 20 years, a long time to wait on a deliverer. And Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, she judged Israel at that time. And don't ever let anyone tell you that God said a woman shouldn't speak the word of God. Deborah was a prophetess. There were many, many others. Miriam, the sister of Moses, was a prophetess. Huldah was a prophetess. New Testament, Philip had four virgin daughters. They were all prophetesses. And she, Deborah, dwelt under a palm tree of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in Mount Ephraim. And the children of Israel came up to her for judgment. This, she sat or dwelt under, it means she sat there in judgment. Uh, Genesis chapter 35, verse 8. We learn that Rebekah had a nurse who was also named Deborah. Uh, she was buried under an oak tree uh, that they called Alon Bakuth, which means the oak of weeping. Could this be the same tree? Well, it says palm tree here. Uh, Deborah, the nurse of Rebekah, it was an oak tree. I don't know. Verse 5. And she, Deborah, well, we got that. Verse 6. And she, Deborah, sent and called Barak, the son of Abinoam, out of Kadesh Naphtali. And said unto him, Hath not the Lord God of Israel commanded, saying, this is prophecy, Go and draw toward Mount Tabor, and take with thee ten thousand men of the children of Naphtali and of the children of Zebulun. Note that and this Tabor, by the way, lie on the boundary between Issachar and Zebulun. Note that God established where this was going to happen for a reason. And I will draw unto thee the river Kishon Sisera. That's the, the general, if you will, of the armies of Jabin. The captain of Jabin's army with his chariots and his multitude. And I will deliver him into thine hand. And when God tells you, I will deliver the enemy into thine hand, don't be fearful, even if they have chariots with iron, the, the blades that go around. If God says, I give you the victory, he means just that. And Barak said unto her, If thou wilt go with me, then I will go. But if thou wilt not go with me, then I will not go. I mean, we're talking about a seasoned warrior here. And Barak's saying, I'm not going unless you go, Deborah. Is he uh, mistrusting Deborah? Uh, mistrusting possibly his own strength? I think the latter was the case, and there'll be a penalty for it. And she said, I will surely go with thee. 
notwithstanding the journey that thou takest shall not be for thine honor, for the Lord shall sell or deliver Sisera into the hand of a woman. And Deborah arose and went with Barak to Kadesh. This woman that he delivered Sisera into was named Jael, as we'll learn. But Deborah is a patriot. I mean, she earnestly, zealously cares about her nation, her people, and the interest and the authority. And Barak called Zebulun and Naphtali to Kadesh, and he went up with 10,000 men at his feet, and Deborah went up with him. Naphtali and Zebulun answered the call. A lot of the folks did not, as we'll see. Now Heber the Kenite, which was of the children of Hobab, the father-in-law of Moses, uh, had severed himself from the Kenites and pitched his tent under the plain of Zaanam, which is by Kadesh. Now this needs a lot of help. Uh, he lived in the land of the Kenites. He was not a Kenite. Um, the children of Hobab, Hobab was in Numbers chapter 10, verse 29, we learn that he was the son of Raguel, which is Jethro. So Hobab was not the father-in-law of Moses. Jethro was the father-in-law of Moses. Hobab was the brother-in-law of Moses. And this is stated here, introduced here, because it's important to know where Jael and her husband Heber were in relation to the conflict that's soon coming. And they showed Sisera that Barak, the son of Abinoam, was gone up to Mount Tabor. Israel is marching, and it looks like they mean business. And Sisera gathered together all his chariots, 900, even 900 chariots with iron, and all the people that were with him, from Herosheth of the Gentiles unto the river of Kishon, making ready for war. Remember, God drew them to this place as promised through the prophetess Deborah. And Deborah said unto Barak, Up, for this is the day in which the Lord hath delivered Sisera into thine hand. Is not the Lord gone out before thee? Question. So Barak went down from Tabor and 10,000 men after him. Charge. And the Lord discomfited Sisera. This, there was a supernatural phenomenon, a flood, as we'll learn in a moment. And all his chariots and all his host with the edge of the sword before Barak, so that Sisera lighted down off his chariot, chariot and fled away on his feet. We're going to learn that this supernatural phenomenon was a flood. You know, chariots don't go do well in mud that's eight feet deep because of a flood. Their chariots got stuck in the mud and they fled. But Barak pursued after the chariots and after the host unto Harasheth of the Gentiles, and all the host of Sisera fell upon the edge of the sword. Better they fell by the edge of the sword. And there was not a man left. Well, there was one man left. Howbeit Sisera fled away on his feet to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite. For there was peace between Jabin, the king of Hazor, and the house of Heber the Kenite. In other words, he could feel comfortable uh, there. And Jael went out to meet Sisera and said unto him, Turn in, my lord, turn in to me, fear not. And when he had turned in to her, unto her into the tent, she covered him with a mantle, with a carpet, making him feel comfortable. And he said unto her, Give me, I pray thee, a little water to drink, for I am thirsty. And she opened a bottle of milk and gave him drink and covered him. I don't know about you, but a big glass of milk sure makes me sleepy. He asked for water. She gave him milk. 
making him very comfortable. Again, he said unto her, Stand in the door of the tent, and it shall be when any man doth come and inquire of thee, and say, Is there any man here? Thou shalt say, No. Sister and knew that somebody would be coming to look for him. Then Jael, Heber's wife, took a nail of the tent, and took an hammer in her hand, and went softly unto him, and smote the nail into his temples, and fastened it unto the ground, for he was fast asleep and weary, so he died. Sisera delivered into the hand of a woman, as prophesied by the prophetess Deborah in verse 9. Jael was a patriot. And behold, as Barak pursued Sisera, Jael come out to meet him, and said unto him, Come, and I will show thee the man whom thou seekest. And when he came unto her tent, behold, Sisera lay dead, and the nail was in his temples. She nailed his head to the ground. So God subdued on that day Jabin, the king of Canaan, before the children of Israel. And the hand of the children of Israel prospered and prevailed against Jabin, the king of Canaan, until they had destroyed Jabin, the king of Canaan. We're going to continue on into verse 5, where we find the song of victory of Deborah. <clears throat> verse 1, Then sang Deborah and Barak, the son of Abinoam, on that day, saying, a song in the Bible seals the emotions. Uh, you may recall in, in Deuteronomy chapter 15, we find the first song of Moses. The second song of Moses, you find in Deuteronomy chapter 32, it's called the song of Moses. Praise ye the Lord for the avenging of Israel, when the people willingly offered themselves. Well, some of the people willingly offered themselves, uh, the men of Zebulun and Naphtali, 10,000. Hear, O ye kings, this is kings of other nations. Give ear, O ye princes. I, Deborah, even I will sing unto the Lord. I will sing praise to the Lord God of Israel. God gave them the victory, and she is giving the credit and glory where the credit and glory are due. Lord, when thou wentest out of Seir, when thou marchest out of the field of Edom, the earth trembled and the heavens dropped. This is dripped better in the Hebrew. The clouds also dropped water. Here we learn of the supernatural phenomenon that took out Sisera and his chariots, a flood. The mountains melted or flowed from before the Lord, even that Sinai from before the Lord, God of Israel. In the days of Shamgar, uh, and Shamgar uh, was the one who killed uh, 600 with, the, uh, uh, ox, with an ox goad. And the son of Anath, uh, in the days of Jael, the highways were unoccupied, and the travelers walked through byways. This is a little hard to understand, but what, it, what it's saying is in the days of Shamgar and Jael, it was too dangerous to take the main highways. People were afraid because of what happened there. They took the back ways to avoid trouble because of the oppression of the enemy, in other words. The inhabitants of the villages ceased, and they ceased in Israel until that I, Deborah, arose, that I arose mother in Israel. A mother binds the family together. They, referring to Israel, chose new gods. That was the cause of their misery. Was there a shield or spear seen among 40,000 in Israel? Israel. The military was weak. She's pointing out that there were no warriors 
to defend against the enemy. My heart or mind is, can be used in that word just, um, just as easily as heart is toward the governors of Israel that offered themselves willingly among the people, bless ye the Lord. The men of Zebulun and Naphtali were patriots. They answered the call. Speak ye that ride on white asses. This is a symbol of being wealthy, prosperous. Ye that sit in judgment. I think this word judgment should have been translated on carpet. That word judgment in the Hebrew, check it out. It can mean carpet. Again, a sign of prosperity. And those who walk by the way, the poor, in other words. What this is saying is, and it doesn't matter if you're rich or if you're poor, this same applies to all. They that are delivered from the noise of archers in the places of drawing water, there shall they rehearse the righteous acts of the Lord, even the righteous acts toward the inhabitants of his villages in Israel. Then shall the people of the Lord go down to the gates. This is probably the warriors returning from war and telling the people, sharing the wonderful works of God, what God did for us. Awake, awake, Deborah. Awake, awake, utter a song. Arise, Barak, and lead thy captivity captive, thou son of Abinoam. Verses 13 through 15, uh, looking back to the conflict of war. Then he made him, Barak, that remaineth have dominion over the nobles among the people. The Lord made me have dominion over the mighty, over the men of Zebulun and Naphtali again, the 10,000. Out of Ephraim was there a root of them against Amalek. After thee, Benjamin, among thy people. Out of Machir, Machir was on the western uh, side of the Jordan, the half-tribe of Manasseh. Uh, Macher was a son of Manasseh, Genesis chapter 50, verse 23. Came down governors, and out of Zebulun, they that handled the pen of the writer. This is a little confusing, but at this time, they mustered the troops. And this one with the pen was mustering troops, uh, getting ready to go to war. And the princes of Issachar were with Deborah, even Issachar and also Barak. He, Issachar meaning the tribe, was sent on foot unto, into the valley. Uh, for the divisions of Reuben, now we come to those who weren't patriots, those who did not come to the war, Reuben being one of them, there were great thoughts of heart. That's all that was on the part of Reuben, was thoughts of heart, no action. Why abodest thou among the sheepfolds, holding back, to hear the bleedings of the flocks? I guess they'd prefer to hear the bleedings of the flocks rather than the trumpets calling to war. For the divisions of Reuben, there were great searchings of heart. A lot of thinking, no fighting. Gilead, this is on the east side of Jordan, the other half-tribe of Manasseh, abode beyond Jordan. They stayed home. And why did Dan remain in ships? Asher continued on the seashore, stayed at port, and abode in his breaches, in safety and away from the battle. Zebulun and Naphtali were a people that jeoparded their lives unto the death in the high places of the field. They answered Barak's call to war. They were patriots. The kings, these are the kings of Canaan, Jabin and his, came and fought, then fought the kings of Canaan at Taanak. But the waters of Megiddo, they took no gain of money. Part of the goal of an army in war is to take spoils, to take riches. 
there was no gain for them. Why? Because God delivered them into Deborah and Barak's hands. They fought from heaven. Don't overlook this. The stars in their courses fought against Sisera. The stars in heaven are the very angels. Uh, made me think about 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 17, where you have the prophet Elisha praying that God would open his armor bearer's eyes to see the army that was encircling them. All he saw was the 180,000 Edomites, and Elisha said, they're here, let's go, let's rise, let's go get them. And his armor bearer said, hey, there's two of us and 180,000 of those. Elisha prayed, and God opened his eyes, and he saw those chariots of fire circling the mountain. When God says he's going to deliver the enemy to you, he means just that, beloved. Doesn't matter if they have 900 chariots of iron. Doesn't matter if they have the Antichrist leading them. The river of Kishon swept them away, their dead corpses. That ancient river, the river Kishon, O oh, my soul, thou hast trodden down strength. Kishon means hard ground, if you translate it. It wasn't very hard when the floods uh, trapped their chariots in the mud. Then were the horses broken by the means of the prancings, the tramplings, the prancings of their mighty ones. Curse ye morose, said the angel of the Lord. That's the Lord himself. Curse ye morose. Curse ye bitterly the inhabitants thereof, because they came not to help of the Lord, to the help of the Lord, to the help of the Lord against the mighty. Morose is never mentioned again. Perhaps it's all of Israel who did not come and answer the call to war. Blessed above women shall Jael, the wife of Heber, the Kenite, be blessed shall she be above or among women in the tent. He, referring to Sisera, asked water and she gave him milk. She brought forth butter in a lordly dish. She put her hand to the nail, the tent nail, a peg you could think of it, and her right hand to the workman's hammer. And with the hammer she smote Sisera, she smote off his head when she had pierced and stricken through his temples. At her feet he bowed, he fell, he lay down. At her feet he bowed, he fell, where he bowed, there he fell down dead. And, you know, J.L. and uh, Deborah were definitely patriots. You know, it's easy to be a patriot when things are going well in a country. It's a little more difficult to be a patriot when things aren't going well. Turn with me to Nehemiah chapter 1 as we continue our study. Nehemiah, and I'll throw in Ezra, was a true prophet of God. Excuse me, a patriot for God. Book of Nehemiah, I'll back up the book of Ezra, written to the Levites. Uh, the book of Nehemiah, uh, written more to Judah in general, and concerns uh, rebuilding the wall and rebuilding the city of Jerusalem. Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 1. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah, and it came to pass in the month Chislu. Chislu is the ninth month on the Hebrew calendar, relates to November and December on our calendar. In the twentieth year, as I was in Shushan, the palace. Shushan is where Daniel was, uh, Daniel chapter 8, verse 2. At that time, it was controlled by the Babylonians, the time of Daniel. 
Now it's controlled by the Persians uh, who had defeated the Babylonians. That Hanani, Hanani, I think a shortened version of Hananiah, uh, one of my brethren came, he and certain men of Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews, those of Judah, that had escaped, which were left of the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. He has a chance to find out how things are going back, back home. And they said unto me, the remnant that are left of the captivity, there in the province, referring to Judah, are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. After the third uh, attack by the Babylonians, uh, there wasn't much left of Jerusalem. This is not good news for Nehemiah. Uh, it hurts him to hear this about Jerusalem. And it came to pass when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Now here we see Nehemiah was a man of prayer. Uh, we also see that he was familiar with God's word by what happens next. And said, and said, I beseech thee, O Lord God of heaven, the great and terrible God, revered God, that keepeth covenant and mercy for them that love him and observe his commandments. You have to be a doer of the word, not just a hearer. James chapter 1, verse 22 and 23. Let thine ear now be attentive and thine eyes open that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant, which I pray before thee now day and night for the children of Israel thy servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel which we have sinned against thee. Both I and my father's house have sinned. Nehemiah is not one to look for someone to blame the situation on. He's taking just as Daniel took the sins of the people, didn't say, why did you do this to us, Lord? He says, we have sinned. We have fallen short. And he realizes that. That's the way you want to do when you fall short. Don't look for somebody to blame. Take the, the, the blame. Take what you did and admit it and take the punishment that comes along with it. We have dealt very corruptly against thee and have not kept the commandments, nor the statutes, nor the judgments which thou commandest thy servant Moses and Nehemiah and us. Remember, I beseech thee the word that thou commandest thy servant Moses, saying, If ye transgress, I will scatter you abroad among the nations. Leviticus 26, 33. Deuteronomy 28, 64. God says, if you do things my way, I'll take care of you. Things will go good. If you don't do things my way, I'll scatter you from one end of the earth to the other. He can scatter you from one end of the earth to the other, or he can bring you back home. And that's what Nehemiah is praying for, is that God allow them to return home. But if you turn into me, God speaking, and keep my commandments and do them, though there were of you cast out unto the uttermost part of the heaven, yet will I gather them from thence and will bring them unto the place that I have chosen to set my name there. Now these are the, thy, thy servants and thy people whom thou hast redeemed by thy great power and by thy strong hand. O Lord, I beseech thee, let now thine ear be attentive to the prayer of thy servant and to the prayer of thy servants who desire to fear thy name, to revere thy name, and prosper. I pray thee, thy servant, this day, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man, the king of Persia, 
at this time, or tax shastah, uh, for I was the king's cup bearer. Now, the cup bearer was a fairly high ranking official, very trusted. I mean, the cup bearer, he tasted of anything that, bef that was presented to the king to drink. Why? To make sure it wasn't poisoned. So he was very trusted, uh, high ranking official. Was that a coincidence? Well, no, I don't think so. You consider Joseph, when he went into Egypt, he became second fiddle to Pharaoh himself. Was that coincidence? No. God in control. Obadiah in Samaria, that, that prophet of God who worked for Ahab, probably arguably the worst, one of the worst kings of Israel. But he was high-ranking official, and God placed him there. And it came to pass in the month Nisan, this is the same as Abib, uh, the first month on the Hebrew calendar. In the 20th year of Artaxestah, uh, the king, the king of Persia, that wine was before him. And I took up the wine and gave it unto the king. Now I had not seen before time sad in his presence. Part of the job of a cupbearer was to uh, lift the spirits of the king. But in this case, he's sad. And the king is going to realize it and realize something's wrong. Wherefore the king said unto me, Why is thy countenance sad, seeing thou art not sick? You better not be sick if you're hand, you know, taking of my cup and then passing the cup to me. This is nothing else but sorrow of heart. Then I was very sore afraid. And said unto the king, let the king live forever. Why should not my countenance be sad when the city, Jerusalem, the place of my father's sepulchers, where my ancestors are buried, lieth waste, and the gates thereof are consumed with fire. Then the king said unto me, For what dost thou make request? So I prayed to the God of heaven. Don't overlook that. When, when you have something major in your life about to come to pass, don't forget to go to the Father. I mean, he has the power to change people's minds if he cho so chooses, good thing to do. You know, Nehemiah is taking on a monumental task. There were times that they had a hammer in their one hand and a sword in the other. Why? Because they didn't have walls in Jerusalem and they were trying to rebuild the city. They'd build a while and then fight a while, the enemy off. They'd build a while and then fight a while. It was not good times in Jerusalem. It was hard times in Jerusalem. But Nehemiah remained a patriot. And I said unto the king, If it please the king, and if thy servant have found favor in thy sight, that thou wouldest send me unto Judah, unto the city of my father's sepulchers, that I may build it, rebuild the wall, rebuild the city. And the king said unto me, the queen also sitting by him, For how long shall thy journey be? And when wilt thou return? So it pleased the king to send me, and I set him a time. In chapter 13, verse 6, we learn that time was some twelve years. Moreover, I said unto the king, If it pleased the king, uh, let letters be given me to the governors beyond the river, beyond the Euphrates, that they may convey me over till I come to, Ju Ju to Judah, Jerusalem, in other words, permission from the king to pass through their provinces. And a letter unto Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the palace, which appertain to the house, and for the wall of the city, and for the house that I shall enter into, his own home. And the king granted me according to the good hand of God upon me. Moses, 
was a patriot. In conclusion, and it might surprise you, we're going to go to the book of Hebrews, the New Testament, where we learn that Moses was a patriot. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 11. We're going to pick it up with verse 23. Just a few more verses to wrap this up. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. This proper child in Exodus chapter 2, verse 2, it, it reads that he was a goodly child which means he was divinely good-looking. And I don't know about you, but when I try and picture Moses in my mind, for some reason, Charlton Heston keeps (laughs) popping in. I mean, he was divinely good-looking. Now, what this is talking about is that if you go to Exodus chapter 1, the midwives who were Egyptians were instructed by Pharaoh when they were attending the Hebrew women giving birth on the stool, if it was a male child, they were to kill it. You see, the people of Israel were prospering under bondage. They were becoming quite numerous. And Pharaoh was going, man, if they keep multiplying like they, they're multiplying, they're going to outnumber us before too long. What did Moses' mother do? Well, she hid Moses for three months. And when she could no longer hide him, she made an ark out of bulrush and sealed it with slime and tar, if you will, and placed Moses in it. What happened in the river, the Nile River? What happened? Well, Pharaoh's daughter noticed and sent people to fetch the ark. She took Moses to be her son. Moses knew he was not a fit to be Pharaoh's daughter. He didn't look like them. He was a Hebrew. They were Egyptian. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. When he found out, who he really was. Your inheritance is very important. Who your father is, is very important. Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people, the Hebrews, Israel, of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. You see, Pharaoh's daughter was very, very wealthy. She could have anything she wanted. So could her son, Moses. Moses could have just said, you know, hey, I got it pretty good here, being Pharaoh's son or his daughter's son. Did he say, okay, that's good with me? No. He was a patriot. He said, I know who my father is. I know I don't belong here as the son of, of Pharaoh's daughter. Don't miss this next verse. Esteeming the reproach. This word reproach is contumely. And I don't know if you're like me, I had to go to the dictionary and looked up what does contumely mean. It means insulting treatment of Christ, greater riches than the treasure of Egypt for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. Moffat translates this, he kept his eye on the reward. He knew that the insulting treatment that Christ would receive. You mean Moses knew Christ was going to come? He said that there's going to be a star come out of Jacob. Of course he knew there was going to be a Christ And rather than for the short period, the short term, 
live in luxury of being Pharaoh's daughter's son, he chose to be of his own people who were oppressed. I remember Charlton Heston. He was, I mean, he was making those bricks and stomping that straw down into the clay. I don't know about you, but that, I think that was the first movie I ever saw in my life was The Ten Commandments. We loaded up the family, Arnold, Anna, David, and Martha, and me, and away to the drive-in theater we went. I think I fell asleep probably through about the first quarter of it, but I remember seeing Charlton Heston. But I'm going to wrap it up there. And you know, it's good to be a patriot for your country. But this Independence Day, I encourage each of you to be a patriot for the Lord. By that I mean be zealous for his interest and his authority. Let's go to his throne. Yahweh Heavenly Father, we do thank you for our great country, Father. We thank you that you're our Father. We love you. Uh, let everything that we do this day be the honor and glory of your name and a reflection of the love that is Jesus Christ. In Jesus' precious name, amen. The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the Mark of the Beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. Of their immediate family members uh, failed to participate in the first resurrection of Revelation chapter 20 verses 4 and 5, the Zadok can leave the Millennial Temple and try to help their immediate family member, talk some sense into them. And obviously they'd have to know them in order to go to them. You see, we're all in spiritual bodies from Ezekiel chapter 40 to the end. Brunel in Minnesota, why do we need the leaves for healing when we have Jesus Christ. Revelation chapter 22, verse 2. Let me ask you, where do the leaves come from? The leaves come from the tree of life. And I hope you know the tree of life who was in the Garden of Eden in Genesis is Jesus Christ. And Rick in Tennessee. Given that Satan once held an esteemed role in service to God, and started out presumably good. He was a cherub that protected the mercy seat, Ezekiel chapter 28. Do you think there could arise a new evil entity that is against God in the eternity, the third age, after Satan and his followers have been blotted out? That's an interesting question. If Satan started out good and turned bad, what's to keep someone from that after the eternity and the lake of fire is done away with, then what's to keep someone else who is good from turning bad? I guess I would answer that, that the answer is found in Revelation chapter 22, verses 3, 4, and 5, which is in the eternity. And it states there, the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it and his servants shall serve him. Verse 5, they will reign forever and ever. If someone goes bad, God and the Lamb are in charge and they will know what to do. B.A. in Arkansas. Is the Old Testament relevant? Oh boy, is the Old Testament relevant. Uh, Thou shalt not steal. Do you think that's not relevant, relevant today? Well, we learn that in the Old Testament, Exodus chapter 20. Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 and 18, Jesus said, I come not to change one jot, that's the smallest 
Hebrew letter that looks like a comma in English, or tittle. A tittle is an ornamental dot that changes the sound of a Hebrew letter. But he who commits kills, and the law says thou shalt not kill, that's to do murder. Uh, that is very relevant. You follow with another question. Why did the Lord God who formed us out of the ground, every beast of the field and every fowl of the air, bring them to Adam uh, to see what he would call them. Genesis chapter 2 verse 15, God put Adam in charge of the Garden of Eden and uh, that he gave him the right to name. David from Georgia, I'm writing to ask you a question. I used to be a homosexual. I did not know it was an abomination until I started studying with the chapel. Can I be forgiven if it's an abomination unto God? I asked God for help and he helped me. I no longer do those things I used to. Your dad said because God would help me if I asked him to overcome and he helped me. I did this is why I stay with the chapel. I hope someday I can get to meet you, Pastor Dennis. I miss Pastor Arnold, but I still enjoy his teachings. I know it's the truth. Homosexuality is not the unforgivable sin. Uh, David, you are in good shape. You've changed your life. You've found God. You've repented, I'm sure, and asked for forgiveness. Go forth and be productive for the Lord. Again, I want to thank you all for inviting me into your homes over the last several weeks. Uh, it's an honor that you do so, and again, I'll never take it for granted. Uh, I love you because you enjoy reading that letter that God wrote to you, the Bible. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, help us keep coming to you and to reach out to others who are lost in this world of darkness. There's a bunch of them. Most important this, though, you stay in his word every day, every day, and your father's word is a good day, even with trouble. Do you know why? It's because Jesus Yeshua, he is the living word. Hearing God's word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Dennis Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast CD, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a CD catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645. 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at the same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.